feel like singing a song uh, that is kind of a Christmas song from Jesus. It's uh, you probably know the the lyrics. It's uh, from the chorus, uh, and the song is called "Christ Has Come."
Yeah, the last time we were here, we were over there, so this is a whole new acoustic here. Yeah, we can really enjoy the music. Well, Merry Christmas, everyone. Thank you for coming. We can't think of a more wonderful way to spend Christmas together than just here in our hearts and feeling that love and connection and a time of prayer too, to, to let up and let go of anything that, that blocks the light from our awareness. I remember that section in the Course where Jesus is encouraging everyone, bring anything that still hurts you, bring it to the Holy Spirit this Christmas time. That's, that's like his wish for Christmas. Bring, bring whatever hurts you to the Holy Spirit and be free of it, be released of it. So, it's just been dawning on me too that this, this world is a dream and, and as we deepen on the spiritual journey, we are learning how to read the signs and the symbols and become very good at, at dream interpretation because that's really how the Holy Spirit can reach us, through dream interpretation. We seem to get off into chaos and havoc and drama when we blank out and really are not aware that we're dreaming and we're taking our perceptions very seriously. When we're interpreting them in very dark and serious ways, it can be quite a drama, it can be quite dark. But the purpose is really to start to let the Holy Spirit interpret our dream symbols for us. So it seems like every year there's so many symbols that come and We've been enjoying a lot of symbols this year, 222. Two, two. Yeah, everywhere. Everywhere. 2022. We got married on February 22nd, 22nd of 2022 at 222 p.m. <laughs> and then the symbols have just followed us all the way through the year, including uh, getting stuck in a snowstorm in Minnesota and, <laughs> and hearing the pilot say our, our departure will be very soon and the distance we will cover down to Jacksonville is 222 miles. <laughs> so it's been twos, twos, twos all the way along. And I think we can start to see that the Spirit can be very playful with the use of symbols and we can start to just enjoy the symbols as they come to us instead of seeing that there is a problem. And I was just pondering today how beautiful it is to really remember that there really are no problems. Any problem that appears in perception has been made up. It's a make-believe problem, not a reality. So anytime we start to take something in the dream serious, then that is just trying to make a problem where there isn't a problem. And that also brings up this curious, I, you might say, methodology of problem solving, which human beings seem to be quite focused on. Everyday problem solving. And what Jesus is really wanting us to understand is that it's not that the problems that we perceive need to be solved, but that the very belief that there are problems at all is what we have to raise up into awareness. We need to pray to be shown that there are no problems, we never have had problems, and we never will have problems. <laughs> and therefore we are not really meant to be focused so much on problem solving, but just on prayer and faith to be shown another way of, of looking at the world, to see the world differently. 
So that's why Jesus is telling us, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. It's being lit up in mind to have a good laugh and start to realize that what you thought was so, isn't so. So I think that also shows us that as we start to move deeper into the Spirit, we are going to have our perceptions transformed very, very radically. Because with our perception of a fragmented world, we are not seeing clearly at all. It's like in Corinthians in the Bible, looking through a darkened glass. We're just not seeing when we're in the dark, when the filter is clogged, but when we clear the filter, then we see the world in a completely different way. So the prayer has to be one of, of learning to be guided and to let the Holy Spirit use our judgments to unwind us from this dark way of perceiving. And when we open up to the idea of God's will being perfect happiness, we can see that, that the reason the ego made perception was to convince our mind that perfect happiness was impossible. To make the perfect happiness seem like a far off, unreachable dream. Uh, I think Frank Sinatra did, did a song called The Impossible Dream. And I remember my dad played that song a lot. <laughs> to reach the impossible dream. This is my quest to follow that star. No matter how hopeless, no matter how far. Yeah. To dream the impossible dream. That's pretty much what this world is. To dream the impossible dream. And to cover over the idea of perfect happiness. So it makes it seem like an impossibility. So, our experience has been that, that that's why the guidance is so important. Guidance is, is a way of the Holy Spirit using something that the ego made, which the ego made judgment. It made judgment for a reason, and that reason was to try to bring some order into chaos. Whether you call it the fall from grace, or the fall from heaven, or the dream of forgetfulness, forgetting God's love and oneness. But, but this realm of dreaming a world of separation was initially experienced by the mind as very chaotic. And so judgment was an invention of the ego to bring some order into chaos. And that's why the ego judges, compares, rank orders, and what it did was it took the cosmos of images and just put them in a rank order or a hierarchy of illusions that seemed to bring the mind into a semblance of order, but actually not a peaceful sense of order. It still was an unsettled state of order. Just like if you had uh, a preschool and the children left the room, or the children stayed there, and the, the teacher left the room, and the children got into a food fight. <laughs> and when the teacher came back, she saw there was food on the ceiling, on the faces, all over the kids, and she screamed, stop, stop, all the girls over here, all the boys over there, put your food down. And immediately the order was trying to be restored to a chaotic, was the preschool room with food everywhere. So the ego used the judgment to try to bring a sense of order into a very chaotic situation. The reason it's chaotic, of course, is because before the seeming fall, the mind was used, used to heaven, so everything was bliss. When you go from bliss into something other than bliss, the feeling is chaos. The feeling is, oh my God, what happened? So now the Holy Spirit has to use the judgment to 
unwind the mind from this entire chaotic perception. So we could say God's will, which is for perfect happiness, is just the state of heaven. And then the one thing we could say about perception, as you go through the awakening, it will seem more and more unfamiliar, it will seem more strange. When you get closer to the lawns of heaven, uh, what seem to be your everyday perceptions of this world start to become so loosened that it may feel more like a, like a hallucinogenic uh, drug experience than approaching heaven, because it's so different. So when Je Jesus said, judge not lest you be judged, he's basically saying that any judgment whatsoever will block out the awareness of this bliss from your mind, even the slightest judgment. You know, a, a cup of iced tea is a judgment. Uh, an iPhone is a judgment. It's not like it's not like we just have to stop all people from judging all other people. A person is a judgment. Everything that was made to be as if a separate object, a, a, the stars are judgments, the, the black holes are judgments, the oceans, the planets are judgments, everything, the solar systems are judgments because they seem to set off something as if it exists in and of itself, apart from all the other images in the cosmos. So there's parts in A Course in Miracles, in, for example in Lesson 128, he, he does this, he does, he does it in a number of parts of the Course, in the text and in the workbook. Well, he, he says basically, you're perceiving a fragmented world in which images seem to exist in and of themselves and they're set off by time and space. And, and in your world, you perceive this is just the way things are. Objects are objects. Images are images. Things are things. <coughs> stuff is stuff. But, this is all invented. There, there are no such things as things or, or images or objects in, in heaven. Heaven is pure abstraction and when you come closer to it, it feels like something's being taken away from you and it's really, you could say, it's just the old, familiar, egoic way of perceiving the world is being rinsed away, is starting to fade away. And that's why we gather, like this gathering. We're here at Christmas to, to in some sense, get a, a different perspective on, on the awakening, because from the ego's perception, it seems as if things are being taken away <coughs> from us. We titled this retreat, The Light of Christmas. Yeah, originally. Originally, but <laughs> as we came closer to the retreat and we started to receive the feedback and everything, we decided to call this Marriage, Divorce, and Eternity. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little more appropriate for this gathering. There's a lot of issues up for the participants around marriage, divorce, and eternity. <laughs> eternity, that was your nickname <laughs> when, I, when I first met you. Cindy, oh. <laughs> Cindy was called Eternity, so she'll be representing Eternity. Still my email. Some things haven't changed, that's good. So, what that does is it starts to put us into a context to see things in a different way. Because when we, when we talk about marriage, divorce, and eternity, the marriage is oftentimes seen as, as 
a desire for a union experience. That's what a marriage is. It's a desire for a union experience. And divorce can have many different meanings, but we do know from A Course in Miracles that Jesus says all things work together for good. So whatever seems to be occurring in the dream, what Jesus is convincing us of is everything that's occurring is happening for your awakening. Nothing is happening against you and everything is happening for you, or more specifically for your mind, not for you as a person. Because when those interpretations come in, it's, it's very dark and very personal and, and the highs and the lows can be interpretations that can be very fleeting. But eternity is something that's, that's beyond the, the judgments of this world, beyond the, the rights and the wrongs of the judgments of the world. And so since this is going to be a very interactive uh, retreat, that felt like that would be very helpful. I don't know if you have a, a song about that though. I could sing eternal. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Perception. Perception is just nothing more than an opportunity to regain or to remember the eternal. So we can talk a little bit about the dynamics that perception has no other purpose. It was made by the ego. Jesus says the world was made in hate, where it was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. And so, if the reinterpretation of perception is an opportunity to regain the awareness or to remember the eternal, then that gives us a very focus for this world. That means that our time is not at random. Time. Jesus says, time can waste and be wasted by the ego, but actually time and perception have a very important purpose to regain eternity and awareness. There's one part in the Course where Jesus says, only a constant purpose can stabilize events. So if you think, and you just look at your entire life in linear time, all the ups and downs, all the things you've done, which I remember Johnny Jacks, he was telling me all the adventures you've had. And you've had some adventures all over the world. We could call you Johnny Adventure instead of no, Johnny. No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually all the adventures of time and space are really just calling on the mind to give them a constant purpose to stabilize all the events. One time, uh, when Bill and Helen were taking down A Course in Miracles, they went through quite a few chapters when they finally got up their courage to ask Jesus, they said, we stop you for a moment, you know, and ask you one question. How did this happen in the first place? They got up their courage to ask Jesus, how did this happen in the first place? And he just said, well, you should know by the emotional ups and downs, the emotional roller coaster of your emotions as a human being, that you believe that it did happen. He wouldn't even tell them how or why, and he wouldn't even acknowledge that it actually happened. But he would say, you believe that it happened because look at your emotions. Your emotions should tell you that something, you believe something happened. And your mind is very powerful, so if you believe it happened, then you can experience it as if it happened. But he wouldn't acknowledge that it actually happened. He was just saying, you believe it, and you are on this emotional roller coaster ride. One time I was talking with Jesus in my mind, and I would say, I always would say, let's cut the chase, let's get down to the, really the core of things. And he said, ever since the belief in separation from God, you feel something is missing. You feel something is lacking. Something has gone terribly wrong. You don't know what it is, but you're, you're quite sure something is amiss. And from this state of lack, you yearn for love. And you seek for it in form. 
but it cannot be found in the form. You're actually looking for it where it can't be found. And so I said, well, okay, seeking for love, seeking for love, yeah, yeah, yes, I've done a lot of that, I've done a whole lot of that. And he said, well, let's look at it from a different angle. Once you seem to forget eternity, you have a yearning for continuity. You want continuity. Because you want something that will last forever. You want something that will endure. You want something that will stay with you. You don't like temporality. You don't like fragmentation. You yearn for continuity. So when we get back to the marriage, divorce, and eternity, the marriage and the divorce part come about in time and space out of the desire for continuity. If you want to find love, you say, I'm going to try to find it in a, in a love partner. And you will go after this construct, which is marriage in this world, because underneath it you have a deep burning desire for continuity. You don't want things to come and go so quickly. Back when I was growing up in the 1960s, they came up with the invention, maybe Cindy remembers, the invention of the Dixie Cup. Remember the Dixie Cup? <laughs> you, they were all on a, a, a row of paper cups, all together, and you could pull your Dixie Cup, it was about this big, and they say you get a little drink, and then crumple, and of course the throwaway society <laughs> in America, filling up the land, the, the land, uh, waste places everywhere. But Jesus would say to me, you see relationships in terms of Dixie Cup relationships, and they don't satisfy you. You see your food in terms of Dixie Cup. You're always getting little tastes of many different things, and you don't get any continuity from it. You're just searching for variety. Oh, here we go. More people coming. Come on in. <laughs> Beautiful. We're just talking about Dixie Cups. <laughs> one, little, one little drink and then you throw it away. And I was saying, Jesus was saying, you're just not satisfied because your heart is yearning for continuity and you're not finding it in time and space. And there's a part of you that's very sad. There's a part of you that's depressed because you're looking for continuity and you're not finding it. You're not finding it in your jobs, you're not finding it in your relationships, you're not finding it in your families, you're not finding it in your hobbies and your interests. You're searching for continuity. And then he went on to point me out in the course where he says that that the present moment is the closest approximation of eternity that this world holds. So if you're going to find any semblance of the continuity that you want, you're not going to find it in the form. No matter how many times you incarnate and reincarnate, it will still be the same story. You will not find continuity in time and space. This is important because this Course in Miracles that we're following with Jesus is here to save us time. It's here to help our mind make a decision that we can go for something that will be fruitful, that will be helpful to us, that will quench our thirst for continuity. Some of you remember 2,000 years ago Jesus met the woman the Samaritan woman at the well, and uh, and he he said, you know, can you give me a drink? And she said, 
but I'm, you're a Jewish man and I'm a Samaritan woman and she went into a big long thing about we, we shouldn't even be interacting and, and he again said, will you bring me a drink? And then he was like a prophet. He, he said, call your husband, but he knew that she didn't have just one husband, she had many husbands. And right away that came to the light very quickly, because he's very telepathic. And eventually he did say the words, drink of me and you will never thirst again. I think that relates to what we're talking about, about continuity. I think it's Jesus, which is our real self, our true self, that was perfect as God created it, was speaking to this woman saying, drink of me and you will never thirst again. He's saying it to all of us. <clears throat> Follow my purpose and take my purpose that I give to you, the calling I give you, your life's calling, and begin to transfer it to every person you meet including yourself, and every situation that you experience. Only a constant purpose, he says in the Course, can endow events with stable meaning. If we want continuity, if we want stability, if we want peace of mind, and still with perception, we have to let go of everything else that we learned about this world. We have to let go of the purpose that the ego had for making relationships, the purpose for jobs and careers, the purpose for our hobbies and interests, the purpose for everything that we perceive in this world. We have to be willing to let it go and say, bring me your purpose, Holy Spirit, so that I may have stability and peace of mind so that I may come close to heaven. Before I wake up to heaven, I can have a happy dream. I can have a peaceful dream, a joyful dream. That's exactly what A Course in Miracles is about. And he goes on to say that linear time is an invention of the ego. God did not create linear time. God did not create past, present, future, he actually tells us that the present moment is before time was. Like he said in the Bible, before Abraham was, I am. It's actually not a point in between the past and the future. That's part of the mesmerism. That's part of the hypnotism. My mother, who just passed away a little over a year ago, was a history teacher. So she spent her entire life teaching thousands of students past, present and future. And Jesus says, not only did the ego make linear time, and God had nothing to do with it, but he says that the ego attempts to force continuity onto linear time. The ego tries to force, Jesus uses the word force, continuity. So here it is, the one thing that we're desiring, continuity, and the ego is trying to force continuity onto past, present, future. You see, the only way the ego can maintain guilt is through linear time. The ego says, you were terrible in the past, the present moment is just a little blip of nothingness, ineffectual, can't do anything about it. The past just rolls over like a steamroller and then it rolls on into the future. So the ego says, you're guilty in the past, you can't do anything about it in the present to change that guilt, and you will be guilty in the future. And that's why the ego came up with concepts like, you'll burn in eternal hell, you'll burn in the flames of hell. Doesn't that, anybody remember that? We heard that one on this planet. That comes from the ego. Burn in eternal flames of hell. Is is an outcome of the belief in linear time. So, so for me, I started to realize that, wow, that is radical stuff and that there's, I'm willing to go for the guidance. I'm willing to let you guide my mind and guide my life and bring me miracles because 
it's apparent to me I'm going to le need lots of miracles and lots of trust and lots of, of epiphanies and, and spectacular moments that show me that things are not as they seem to be. Because when we just admit that things are the way we think they are, based on our past learning, it's very depressing. It's no wonder why people commit suicide. It's no wonder why people are addicted, addicted to antidepressants or, or are so distracted by so many things in this world. Drug addictions, alcohol addictions, sex addictions, uh, addictions to various forms of stimulation where people feel so bored and so depressed about what they perceive to be linear time that they're looking for a way, a distraction. Even a momentary distraction they feel has got to be better than extreme boredom and depression. But underneath it, what Jesus is saying is the gateway to what you really want is to go towards the present moment and towards continuity. Now, how do you go towards the present moment? Well, you do it through guidance. I mean, um, right before we came down here, Igor texted me and, and we had a nice chat on the phone and and we were down here in July, mm -hmm. right over in that boom and everything. And mm -hmm. for Igor and Katerina, not only they are hosting all of us, but they're going through some major shifts and changes in their perceptual world. Their their dream is <laughs> is <laughs> is shifting and teetering in a big way, which is good. I'm glad. I'm glad you all invited us to be part of that, because when you start to go for your intuition, when you start to go for the true continuity, when you start to go for the present moment, the Holy Spirit will loosen things up in your perception in, I'd say, a pretty dramatic way. In fact, an early stage of the development of trust, Jesus says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. He comes right out and says, it will seem as if things are being taken away from you. And the only reason this is happening is because you had put value into something that was valueless. And how else can you learn but through contrast of having things seem to go away? to learn that the value that you sought was, was not in the things, or in the circumstances, or in the situations, or even in the relationships. But the true value of, of spirit is within you. It's you. Your, your real self is what's valuable. The Christ self has all value. And the trinkets of the world, mm, We'll just say they're dream symbols that the Holy Spirit can spin around a little bit to help you realize, oh my gosh, I thought that was valuable and now I'm starting to realize maybe it wasn't as valuable as I thought it was. Of course the ego is in there going, it is valuable and you should be sad and this is terrible. <laughs> Whatever's happening, it will judge whatever's happening in that way. So, so it was beautiful because we're coming down here and, and Igor says, well, we've got you know, a beautiful house, we're going to have the retreat in, it's sold. I said, what about the house across the street? It's sold too. Wow, this is really just a skit. You are in a theater. Enjoy the, the sparkling lights right now. Because in about three weeks, they're gone. <laughs> the whole thing is gone. I like that. I, this reminds me of my years of traveling. I would show up and do it and then I would move on to the next town and people would say, Did, didn't you maintain contact with those people? Didn't you get their email addresses? This was back in the early days of email. I said, no, I, it never occurred to me to get email addresses. I, I was like walking through something and as soon as I passed through it, I was on to whatever would be shown to me next. I wasn't trying to 
maintain contacts with the past. And I was just trying to just show up and have it be brand new and fresh and then move on to the next theme, brand new and fresh. And for me, that was my attempt to find that continuity inside of myself, instead of trying to look for continuity in form. In, in this world, of course the ego has had us look for continuity on the timeline. You know, I, I remember when I grew up in my family, you know, my, uh, my grandfather Heinrich Hermann Hofmeister, who was called Harry, and Lillian were married for 57 years. That's, that's pretty good in this uh, time world, 57 year marriage. But I would have some really good discussions with them because I was interested in finding to the core of what was valuable. And I know I was quoted probably many years saying, I would rather have one instant of complete pure union than 57 years of compromise. <laughs> That's what they, what are you talking about? <laughs> but, but I know in talking to Lillian and, and Harry, they, they really hung in there and they really used their relationship for a lot of forgiveness. But, but I still feel Jesus is saying, one instant spent together restores the whole universe to you. One instant. That he's telling us that you're not really afraid of the things that you think you're afraid of. You're, you're afraid of, of connection. You're afraid of light. You're afraid of redemption. You're afraid of love. And you've got really good at distracting away from love, getting into a bunch of other things that aren't love, and then trying to convince yourself you're in love when you're, you're distracted and addicted into so many things that really God didn't create and don't really have anything to do with them. So it's, it's quite sobering actually when you start to look at that. One instant spent together restores the whole universe to you. That's why when we come together we have great opportunity not so much as to expect that we will reach that instant but, but to hold it dear in our hearts and also be willing to let up into awareness everything that isn't love and not hide it and protect it. And that's what's so important for healing, just to be able to talk about it. Uh, we were coming out, Igor messaged me, I talked to him the next day, well, the houses are, are, are being sold. Really? The house, both houses? Yes, yes. And, we're getting a divorce, you're getting, oh, divorce. I had you on speakerphone, so I was just like, kind of wandering <laughs> through the house, hearing the words that she swore in this lifetime she would never hear. Because <laughs> I had you on speakerphone. And she's just like wandering into the kitchen, just like, what's, what's happening in the world? But, but actually, I said, no, no, this, <laughs> This is, we can rename the, we can rename the retreat now. Because we're all going for healing. We all really are going for healing. We're all going to, to expose anything. And, and I think Igor asked me, has this ever happened before to you? I said, yeah, back in the mid 2000s, I, I went to Argentina. And, and the two were getting a divorce, and it was an Argentinian family, and grown children. And they were all angry and pointing fingers and ready to throw people out of the house. But I actually had a great time. I actually enjoyed these kind of things where I get dropped into a hornet's nest of an Argentinian family that's breaking up. After 32 years of marriage, the husband has an affair with the woman from Uruguay or whatever, and then everybody's emotions erupt and explode. And I think, I'm grateful that I have been sent in by Jesus for two weeks, so I can sit to have heart-to-heart -heart talks with everybody. They could just express their rage and 
express their anger. They wanted, they wanted the, their father, get him out of the house. <laughs> get him out of, out of the house. But no, he was still in the house. And that set up a lot of beautiful conversations where I would sit with everybody and I would say, no, no, this, everything comes down to decisions. And we all have very powerful minds, and we have to equally honor the decisions that are being made. So I talked for two weeks about honoring the decisions that were being made in love, in kindness, in respectfulness. And don't blame, don't, don't, don't try to make somebody right, somebody wrong. I absolutely refused to take a side. The, the, the wife's name was Maria Christina You Are. It's a French name. Mary Christ You Are. That's a setup from Jesus if I've ever heard it. The wife's name is Mary Christ You Are. And, and the husband's name was Alberto Sr., but he was affectionately called by his wife, The King. So, <laughs> this is perfect, an Argentinian family, the king is leaving the queen, and I'm just there to say, calm down, we have to honor and respect the decisions. So, it was two weeks of, of forgiveness, of just saying, let's honor and respect the decisions here. We're, we're not here to take sides, we're not here to make somebody right, we're not here to make somebody wrong, we're not here to dredge up the past. And, and hold things against people. We're here to honor the decisions. And I said, I kept smiling through the whole thing, saying, we can choose peace right now. We can choose peace. They went, ah! <laughs> They're ready to kill each other. But I was like, no, no, there's another way. There's another way. They would say, Dave, if you only knew. No, I don't need to know anything. <laughs> I know, I'm staying here in the spirit of love and reconciliation, and let's treat each other with kindness and respect. So it actually has happened. Now, we got a whole weekend here, or three days here, to, to explore how do we go for continuity? How do we actually go for continuity? Because that's what we seek. We want, to, we want the continuous. In one sense, I think, I can see that's partly why Jesus was having these, these houses sold, is because they had mortgages. Mortgages are instruments of time. <laughs> mortgages are instruments of the ego for distress. <laughs> unless, unless the mortgages are Christ controlled, and I mean fully given over to Christ to manage, unless Jesus Christ is your mortgage manager. <laughs> then you are in for a hellish ride. <laughs> because anything that's an instrument of time, remember, was invented by the ego. And the ego invented this world to keep you from knowing who you are. To keep you from forgiving. To keep you from finding that continuity. So I could actually see the blessing in this was like you had something being lifted off of you that you both, maybe you felt it over in uh, Israel, right? You were, <laughs> you probably felt it first when you were right over there in the Holy Land. <laughs> Can't help the mortgages, now! <laughs> Jesus was, was speaking to you loud from the Holy Land, now! And then when you got back, you didn't even have to call a real estate agent. Jesus made sure that the call was made to you. I want to buy your house. I want to buy both your houses. You see how that's what, that's what happens when you put everything, including your mortgages, under Christ's control. Then Jesus will arrange time and space. And that's a good practical example of loosening from the instruments of time which were made to keep you bound in time, and, and taking you one little step closer to eternity. I'm sure, as we talk, I mean, I think, Gabrielle, you had things where you, when I first met you, you were, you had a company, and you were flying around the United States, and doing all these kind of things, 
with the company and then eventually you sold the company and then the, the people you sold the company to wanted to have you installed as the, the CEO of the company. Little turns, one <laughs> at a time, you see. First Jesus gets the company out from under you and then comes back in a way that you, <laughs> you hadn't anticipated. But that's what I mean by putting everything under Christ's control, because it, it will unwind you little by little out of the, the beliefs that you have about how your value and security is tied into time. And that is not the truth. Our value and security is not tied into time, it's tied into the present moment. So we're all kind of, I call us, we're all saints in training. We're all going through these unwinding experiences. We're being taken closer to our experience of the present moment. And then, you know, there's so many saints throughout history that that have spoken about this. Another thing is, that comes to mind around money is inheritance. Wow, that's really an interesting concept. Because Jesus is saying, your inheritance is the kingdom of heaven. You're, you were created by God, and your inheritance is eternal. But once you put that inheritance onto the timeline, then you see the arguments begin, you see the struggles begin. I remember with my mother and father, at some point I was traveling so much around the United States and Canada and so much around the world that I think they informed me at some point, they said, uh, um, David, we, we don't know how to break this to you, but uh, we've decided to have your sister be the executor of our will. You know? <laughs> That's the most beautiful thing when you've been left out of being the executor of a will. I knew that was <laughs> Jesus. Thank you, he's working overtime. And sure enough, you know, when my mother passed away, then, yeah, I would occasionally get an email or something or a few dollars in the mail. <laughs> and I was very, very thank you. Because, because when you get something like inheritance, which is really divine, and you start to put it on the timeline, you see how, what that does to families. You see brothers and sisters and people fighting, getting attorneys, doing all kinds of things. And it wasn't long after, after uh, I think within this past year, I, I saw something where uh, Gandhi uh, had said, if, he had quite a few children and everything, but, and he was married and he had quite a few children, but I know while he was still alive, Gandhi did say, um, I will be passing on no earthly inheritance to any of my family members, my wife or my children. I was like, wow, that takes guts. That takes guts. He really was into nonviolence. He really was into peace. You know, when you do that. I remember, Cindy, you were going through a divorce one time and, and you were married at the time to a, a millionaire. What's his name, Stanley? Richard. Richard, Richard Stanley. And, and then at, I was in an airport somewhere and, and you called me and said, well, we've, we are going to go through a divorce, but I'm not going to ask for anything. And I remember the millionaire's attorney saying, there is not a woman alive on this planet that will not ask for anything in marriage. But I knew Cindy. I said, I said, she really isn't going to. She's not going to ask for anything in, in the divorce. And that was probably a great teaching for that attorney, <laughs> Richard's attorney, who had to who had to witness that. Like, whoa, there's another... Don't you want a card? Don't you want a card? Don't you want, don't you want something? You know, you see, that's where we start to really see how willing are we to follow Jesus towards the continuity, or how willing are we to follow the ego. Because the ego is always saying safety and security is on the timeline. 
and you need the things of time to be happy. And Jesus is always telling us, no, it's not that way at all. It's not the things of time that will ever bring you eternal happiness. It's actually in beginning to start to see the valuelessness of the things of time and space. So for me, that's been kind of the adventure of my life because as I let go of my university studies, I let go of my pursuit of degrees, I let go of my career, and then began to just travel and accept invitations. One of them was going to Cindy what didn't even own the house. She was she was in Hartville on High Street. I, I really pay attention to the symbols when I'm visiting. You're living in Hartville, Ohio, and and the slogan for Ohio is in the heart of it all. So you're living in Hartville, in the heart of it all, on High Street. And she was living there because a friend of hers had just offered her a place to stay. So she was just, we were in a hot tub and everything, and it was all freely given. And, and that is a symbol of how our life is meant to go. Yes, it's like this. It seems, this place seems like a fairy tale, right? We're looking through fairy lights. We're, <laughs> you can look, look at Gabriel fairy lights. But, but it's meant to be a listen follow where you follow along and you follow your guidance and you go from scene to scene to scene as if you're in a fairy tale, as if you're Cinderella in the fairy tale. And you don't actually need to know what will be in the next scene. That's what right now Katerina and Igor are doing. You don't know exactly what's in the next scene. This is an apartment with two cats in Jacksonville, but, but that will be interesting too, because you don't really know what's coming next. And that's what I started to trust, you know, where Jesus says, trust would settle every problem now. I started to say, well, I'll just keep trusting, and I don't know how it's going to go, and then I'll trust again, and I'll, I'll just learn to take what shows up, and then I'll trust again, and take what shows up. And that is a very different way of living your life than planning for the future based on past learning, which is how the ego set up linear time. Mm -hmm. Always planning for future outcomes based on <clears throat> past learning, on your education, on your past experiences. And trust, and Jesus is saying, no, you won't escape from time and space if you keep going, playing by the ego's games, if you just go your way. Even with all the songs that Sava has received, I don't know, a hundred and some? I think hundred twenty, thirty. Hundred twenty, thirty songs. But each song is, is coming very fresh, like it's just showing up. Sometimes it just comes and stays in your mind until you record it or whatever. But in one sense, that's how your life starts to become. You start to just receive things. And then you appreciate what you receive. And then you appreciate again what you receive. And then you start to say, could I really live my life just listening and receiving and acting upon the guidance that's, that's given to me? You see, that, that goes against all of our programming, all of our conditioning. It's, you know, it's like Robert Frost, it's, it's the road less traveled. You know, following your intuition and following the Spirit is the road less traveled. Now, I think we have a really good three days to explore <laughs> this topic, you know, in, in, in depth. Yes? explore this topic right now, <laughs> because since you start talking, my mind is like, mm -hmm. um, first of all, I love the interpretation, you know, like inter interpreting life as a dream, and I've been doing this more and more often, and as you speak, I, I'm seeing uh, uh, that I'm having like a double divorce right now. <laughs> 28 years of Miami Beach, Dade County <laughs> divorce, and 14 years with my landlord. <laughs> and um, I, circumstances, I just pack everything, Thanksgiving weekend, and 
I am as a guest at my sister's house in Tampa. And um, I have no idea what's next in my life. That does seem to be how things are orchestrated. That's, that's why we're all here, to look at this so deeply. And, and I do know that it's like, they always said, uh, uh, when, when God closes the door, He opens a window, or when doors seem to close from the past, that where we were just repeating and looping in, then there is a fresh opportunity for what I was saying, to find the continuity, to find the purpose, to find the, the hidden purpose for everything. You know, we're so accustomed to thinking that in terms of goals, you know, we the ego has really fooled us into striving for future goals. And we thought ambition was a good thing. I I remember I I was very, 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 very convinced that ambition was good until I was watching the movie Gandhi, and I adored Gandhi, and uh, there was an American journalist who was walking with Gandhi when they were building an ashram in South Africa, and the uh, American journalist's name was, name was Walker. And Walker said to Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi, you're quite an ambitious fellow. And Gandhi answered him saying, I hope not. And I said, I had to stop the movie. What did they say? This guy, I thought Walker was offering Gandhi a compliment. And Gandhi's reply was, I hope not. You're quite an ambitious fellow. I'm waiting for Gandhi to say, thank you so much. But he said instead, I hope not. And that hit me hard. I had to stop the movie because I thought, wow, if Gandhi's saying I hope not, I had to start to question my own beliefs about ambition because they've involved the future. After all, this is America, right? Ambitions for the future, make a better life, and so on and so forth. But, but what Jesus is teaching us is, is if we're going to find that continuity in the present moment, we have to be willing to question every value that we hold. He says, not one can be kept hidden or it will obscure your learning. And so, that was a, a kind of a turning point in my life. I, maybe I was in my 20s when I was watching that Gandhi movie and I had that moment where I just thought, wow, I think I am going to go for truth. I think I'm going to dedicate my life to finding the truth, whatever that is. And it also struck me recently, because I was just watching this movie I'm going to show on the last day of this year called Einstein and Eddingston. And I saw the trailer and I just felt, I told Saul, I said, I know this trailer, I don't know where that movie is, but I said, that feels like really good. And I'm going to show that movie because it touched me so deeply that here are two scientists, a young Albert Einstein, who's been called back from Zurich to Berlin, and Arthur Eddington, who's a brilliant scientist in uh, the UK. And this is back in the early 1900s. This is World War I breaks out, and these two are exchanging letters, except one's a German and one is from Great Britain. And the people around them are like, don't, you can't write letters to these, you can't communicate. They're the enemy. But what I like about these two scientists, they cared more about the truth, even during World War I, than countries, than nationalism. You know, Eddington was all fired up. He, he went looking in his library where he was in his university, and all they had was one paper by Albert Einstein, and he kept reading it over and over fascinated by what Einstein was discovering. And then he went in one day and they said, sorry, that, that one paper has been removed 
the one paper from Einstein that he was reading was removed from the library because he's German. We're at war. It's been buried some down in the archives. He got, he was so mad at it and he went down and digging through the archives to find, find this paper because he was in pursuit of truth. And so was Einstein. You know, Einstein, they said, you know, all these scientists in Germany are, are signing this, say we back the German government, we back the military. You know, here we need your signature on it. Einstein refused absolutely refused to, to sign it, was furious at the idea that they were going to make nitric acids or things to gas people and, and kill people with. Einstein hated war. And, and Eddington, he was, a, he was a Quaker. He was very devoted to God. So here Jesus brings these two together that have this deep yearning to find the truth to find the continuity that we're talking about. Not even a world war could keep these two apart. Together they join minds to come to some huge discoveries about the relative nature of this world. And that God did not actually create gravity. And <laughs> God did not create the, the laws of physics. You know, they, they started to go beyond to the absolute which perfectly lines up with what Jesus is teaching us in the Course. But I am sparked by whenever I see someone who's willing to go for the truth above all else. That's what my life has been about. And I have to say, I, I feel happy that I decided that. I was in my 20s, not usually the most popular time when you decide to just let go of everything. You know, your parents, your relatives, what are you going to do for a living? I want the truth. Does the truth pay? What's the what's the salary? What's the salary for a truth seeker? No, I, I really have no idea. But you can see that's what Jesus is encouraging. He's saying, go for the continuity in the present moment because you'll find it there, and you won't find it in the instruments of time. And Monica, good for you. You <laughs> found yourself right at this retreat. <laughs> we renamed it and you're like, I've got a double divorce. <laughs> yeah. Another uh, song I like that you can play with your... <laughs> I have limited it because my cable is stuck on <laughs> Play my savior. That's a beautiful one. Crying out for help 
Savior, that, that inner intuitive voice that, that knows us as we really are, that's so eager to, to take us into eternity. And yeah, I was thinking of Monica coming after those 30 years and everything. Actually, when little David was four was the last time it snowed in uh, St. Augustine. <laughs> and then, that was 60 years ago, then 30 years ago, I was up in my little um, place in Cincinnati, and I was just praying and praying. And then in 1992, 30 years after that, that first snow, I, Jesus said, go to Florida. So I remember the last time I was here in, in August talking a bit about how I was guided so strongly to, to go with a friend of mine and, and we, we traveled and we toured all around Florida for six weeks and uh, with so many miracles. I'd never done anything like that in my life. Just take off in a car, and go down. I met so many people that were into A Course in Miracles, people that I've never met. I stayed with them, I had these deep conversations with them, I went to course groups, I just decided, Jesus, go ahead and use me. And so the first trip was in 1991, was out across the United States in five and a half weeks, and then this trip to Florida in 1992 was the, was the second big trip. But. It's good as a teaching device because when we rely on our past learning, we don't realize how thick that programming is. You know, 
we're taught we need an education, we need jobs and careers. You you can't go off on most people at the time that thought, I mean, is this some kind of a fairy tale thing? You know, you're going in a car down to Florida, you know. Do you know people? I said, no, that don't, I don't know anyone. That's the fun part. I don't know. I'm going to go to Course in Miracles groups and people took us in. Admittedly, our car was stolen uh, when we got to Miami. <laughs> but that turned into a miraculous adventure. You know, you really don't know how well taken care you are in your life until your car. You're traveling, you've got everything in the car, and then the car is gone. Went to the beach, came back, the car was gone. It just unfolded. We were picked up by park workers. We were taken in. We were taken, right after it happened, uh, our people that we were going to stay with said, well, we need to stop by a 12-step uh, meeting. Would you come? We said, we have no, no car, we'll go wherever. And so they took us to a 12 step meeting. They were, they were in Miami, Florida, they were running a clothing drive. And you know, people down there have some money. So I had a whole new wardrobe. <laughs> a half an hour after the car was gone, I lost my whole wardrobe and I was gifted by these people at a, at a 12 step place, a whole new wardrobe. The woman who was traveling with me, she just smiled and she said, the Holy Spirit dresses you better than you dress you. <laughs> I mean, there was just a comedy show of one thing to the next. But you don't really know about the divine providence. You don't really know that Spirit's got your back. When you have too much education and past learning telling you who you are, where you are, what you are, and how you're going to survive in this world. We've become so adept at following the ego that we're entrenched in ego thoughts and ego beliefs. Money, protected clothing, and literally the car was gone, all the clothes were gone, everything was gone. You know, it's just like even we were walking down by the water and uh, my friend Beverly, her her pants, she rolled them up because her, her, her bottom of her, uh, her long pants were, were wet when we got back to the empty car. And, and she just gave me a look and I just had lines from the Holy Spirit coming, you know, all things work together for good, there are no exceptions, except in the ego's judgment and everything you need, uh, nothing will be denied you. You know, all these lines from Jesus came just at the moment when the car was gone. And that's how we learn to trust our intuition. When things seem to be taken away, like these houses, that will be fun for Katerina and Igor now because the houses will be gone. All the, how much effort did you put into fixing these <laughs> houses up over the past six months? It's like making a theater stage. We all come, we get to enjoy the theater, and then poof, <laughs> poof, it's gone. And, and the same with Monica, you know, you've left so much behind down there in the southern part of Miami, but now it's a fresh start. And that may seem to the ego kind of risky and scary, but actually, what I was saying at the very beginning was, the only purpose of perception is to be used by the Spirit to lead us back to our remembrance of eternity. There's, there is no purpose for anything in this world other than everything being retranslated into a forgiven world and then us waking up to our eternal nature. So once we start to look at it that way, it does start to be like an adventure. The ego would say it's risky. And of course I had many people back then in the early 1990s that were saying, David, you're taking the course too far. <laughs> like you, it doesn't literally mean, <laughs> you know, like in 128, the world I see holds nothing that I want. And I was like, nothing, nothing at all that I want. I was like, in my probably but back then, yeah, maybe early 30s. Uh, and it was like, 
the world I see holds nothing. Don't take it literally, David. You know, don't 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 get too fanatic on this. But that song, "You Are My Savior," I believe in you. You can feel the energy around that. That, that if you're caught up in a dream world and you're taking the dream world interpretation seriously, and you're feeling stress and darkness and heaviness, and you feel sad, you feel tired, you feel sick, you know, if you feel these things, Jesus is saying, please choose again. Please, I've been, I've been here for you all along. I'm, I'm closer than your breath. I'm so close right here, and I'm so willing to offer you the guidance. And the guidance will seem to unwind you from what you've already built, from what you've already made. It's kind of like going to the beach down here and making sandcastles, you know. We used to do that as kids. We would make these intricate sandcastles and we would just wait till the tide came in and you know, and it was gone. And I, I can see now the spirit trying to get my attention saying, yeah, this is a world of sandcastles. But don't put too much belief and too much value in the things that you seem to build. Because that will turn into a tragedy, it will turn into a drama, it will turn into a loss. My mother passed away last year, uh, December, 7th. December 7th, Pearl Harbor Day. And um, we were out in Utah, I think she she visited us, uh, we were out there with her, we adopted her cat, because uh, the cat needed a home, so the cat became Unity. Mm -hmm. And we were out there and we were in a, in a bedroom and there was a window there, looking to a, like a courtyard there, and then Svava said, turn around and look, because the door into the, our sunroom, and I was saying, you could, I turned around and looked, and we both watched the handle move <laughs> and the door open. And I went, oh, Evelyn's with us. <laughs> She's, we can feel her. She's coming right into the house, this big house with the cat. We had her cabin and she, we saw the handle move and she came and just joined us. But, but there's been, you start to see that you don't ever really lose people because people are thoughts in your mind and they're, they're just reflections of what you believe in. They're just means of showing you, in your mind, what you believe in. That's all, they don't really go anywhere. <laughs> There's nowhere to go. Everything is happening in the theater of the mind. And, and once you start to, every day, just start to look around and say, oh, what is the dream showing me today, or what is it that I need to learn today, or what is it that you're showing me, and you start to come at it from that perspective, then it, it helps you forgive so much faster than thinking of people as people. Thinking of people as someone that you're attached to, someone that you can't live without, someone that you would feel grief if, if they were gone. And you know, it still comes down underneath it. Every time we grieve, every time we feel sorrow, every time we feel loss, it's still this desire for continuity that we still have. And we've been looking for it in the form. And we, we get so disappointed when the form doesn't go the way that we had planned. Not realizing that this is the Holy Spirit knocking on our heart again, going, I'm here, <laughs> I'm the continuity, <laughs> I'm the Spirit, I'm the, the communication that you want, I'm the connection that you want, I'm the, the warm glow that you want, I'm the nurturing that you want. I'm here, I'm always with you, but you won't know it if you keep seeking for it in these persons, places, and things. And I felt more and more like, wow, oh, this whole world is just a series of seeming release and release points and letting go. And I, I feel grateful now that, that I have a context for everything, because when something starts to disappear, I can, I can enjoy the disappearing <laughs> instead of 
I like how workbook lesson, you know, the first workbook lesson is nothing I see means anything. Then the second one is I've given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me. And I was just reflecting too how, wow, that second lesson, I have given everything I see, all the meaning it has for me, is the ego is really big on beginnings and endings. You know, whether it's a, a body celebrating the birth of a baby, or the death of, of, of a body, it means a lot to the ego, you know. Long periods of grief or big celebrations that go on. We celebrate repeatedly birthdays over and over, every, every year, you know, that's the time for people to come together and celebrate birthdays. And then death, there's a funeral and there's usually periods of grief and mourning and I was over at a, one time I was, think I was in the Canary Islands and I talked to a friend and she, she was supposed to go to a, a, a monastery in the Canary Islands and she got there, I think it was a Buddhist monastery and she got there and she was all excited to pray and meditate with the monks and everything and when she arrived, the, the, the abbot, the head monk had just died. And they were closing the monastery for a traditional one year of grieving. <laughs> and she was like, David, it's crazy. I went there all excited to, to be in a monastery and they, they shut the monastery down to, for a year of grieving, which is part of the tradition of this particular group. But I thought, look at that. And then we have somebody like Jesus saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end in total joy. He's, he's saying in total joy, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's like saying, trust in me and you will never taste death. Trust in me and you will know eternal life. Trust in me, I am the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega. But yeah, this is the kind of thing that a lot of times people don't share because it's like, well, I don't want to go and bring everybody down and tell them what we're going through, and then the whole thing gets renamed <laughs> before before you got here. It all just got renamed because we want healing. We do want healing. We want expansive joy. We want to feel vibrant. We want to feel connected all the time, not just uh, on on special occasions or certain occasions. And I think. You know, that's the, that's the way of reframing it, putting it in the context of that everything that seems to occur is happening for us to reach our full potential, to reach our, our natural state of mind. That nothing, isn't that refreshing to think that nothing has ever gone wrong in our life, or ever will go wrong. <laughs> it's just that we have to stay present to like an emotional honesty, like here's what I'm dealing with right now. Not hide it, not protect it, but just talk about it. You know, I think it is a course in using relationships to heal. It is a course in reinterpreting everything that happens in, in a very radical way. And, uh, and I think, I mean over the years, I, I've had a, done a lot of retreats and gatherings, some of them two days or three days, some of them six weeks, but um, I just am always grateful for the healings. I mean, I've, I've actually done a six week retreat where someone came that was diagnosed with cancer and went into complete remission by the end of the retreat because there was such a thorough opening up to letting all the thoughts up and the, that she had been wrestling with and hiding. Um, I've just seen how that's the purpose of everything we really do is for, is for healing and we're not really in charge of, uh, of anything. And so it did become pretty obvious. I mean, after I first talked with uh, Igor, then I yeah, I was talking with Sala, and it wasn't very long after that that we were saying, Just right after the call, yeah. Right after the call. Yeah, it just kind of changed, it repurposed, you know, in terms of the themes. 
um, because it's it's part of the thing I will let back step back and let him lead the way you know where we just don't feel like we're trying to do anything for the world we're just here letting it show itself and I know it's 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 a lot of deep healing that's involved with it I think it was the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, do not store up your treasures on earth and store them up in the kingdom of heaven. And so all the things that make up my life, quote unquote, at that moment, it's, it's actually a really fun job. And I like the people I'm working with. And condo's pretty nice, little, about this size. And it's all good in that sense, but I can just feel it kind of, you know, disintegrating. Yeah. <laughs> kind of like, a, what is it, pixelated, like the pictures just kind of like the sand yeah. in sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea. Yeah. It is quite fascinating. I know as you get back to the very back of the text, Jesus has a section called self-concept versus self. And the self he's talking about is the Christ, and the self-concept is the image that the ego made as our identity in this world. So the whole section, self-concept versus self, he says um, that the Holy Spirit's function is exchanging self-concepts. Like, in other words, it would be too much if, if the tablecloth was pulled yanked out and all the silverware and the glasses and the <laughs> casserole and everything went flying all over the place. So he says the Holy Spirit's task is to exchange self-concepts and each time there's an exchange of a self-concept it's a little bit of a loosening from the world. Mm -hmm. And usually there's, there's a bit of fear uh, because the first change that the mind went through was the fall from grace. So now, even when there's a change in relationships, a change in where we're living, a change in our environment, our circumstances of our personal life, there's a bit of trepidation. There's still a bit of fear that gets stirred up because it's, it's a reverberation of that very first fall from grace. But, he says, these changes are always helpful. And I always am fascinated by the idea that the script is written. Imagine that that we're just mentally watching something that has already been filmed. It's like one of those old movies, it's already in the can, it's on the projector, and you can't, when you used to go to a theater, you could watch the film, but you can't really change the film. You can believe, you can identify with the characters, don't go in there, stop, get away from him, you know. We, we can still project meaning onto the, the images that are on the screen. But the idea that it's all part of a prearranged plan and that it's actually always helpful. Every change that seems to occur in form is always helpful for us in the bigger picture. Even though the ego wants to break it apart and say, well that was a good day, that's a terrible day, whoa, I didn't see that one coming. You know, it's, the ego is still trying to navigate itself in what's already a prearranged plan. So I, I just know in my life there's been so many shakeups and shakeups and shakeups in places and people and and things, and then usually while it's happening, at the beginning I was just like I felt like the wheels were coming off, and I thought, what is happening? This is terrible. This is terrible. But then in retrospect, I can see every little loosening was actually a benefit. Um, I was letting go of the past, a little bit at a time, I was, I was taking away my hold on the past, my determination that things had to be a certain way for me to be happy, that I will never be happy unless I can get this back and somehow get that back and, you know, then spent years trying to <laughs> reinvent the past, you know, to get a better version of the past. But, it is, it is amazing uh, how our trust grows stronger and stronger. I mean, I, just as I was flying down here, I, I texted with you there, and then my friend uh, Gemini, uh, Gemini Land, she said, yeah, I've been evicted from my 
house that I've been living in in the last four years is over in Clearwater. And I thought, oh, that's odd. I'm just coming down to Florida and I hadn't heard from her for years. She's getting evicted. I, oh, I'm staying with a friend, but I can just stay here two days. I need a place for, for you know, a couple weeks. I want to move more to South Florida and then came here and then Katerina and Igor said, oh, we have an apartment that, that's good here until the 15th. So there's the, and, and so I, we were able to have a call sitting here, all four of us on this couch. And Gemini was so happy, like, oh my God, I, I don't have a place to stay. And I just thought, I heard in my mind, call, call David or write to David. And then, then it came a place to stay. And, and those are the ways, those are the miracles where things just, perception gets rearranged. It's all for us. And it's all like these miracles just showing us, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out. It's all going to work out for the best but you have to at least suspend the ego judgments for just a little bit to let the miracles kind of come into your mind and show you and convince you over and over and over. But yeah, I'm just, we're just so honored to be down here and be, be used and with all of you at this, in this way to start to explore these things much more deeply because that's all we want. We all want to feel safe and secure. You know, we, nobody wants to feel like something's being ripped away or that we're making a wrong turn or that we're doing something that we're going to regret. You know, nobody wants to live with regrets. Nobody wants to live life based on fear of consequences. Like, what's going to happen to me? So it's like an honor that we've all been brought together. We didn't even know what this retreat would be, but it's it seemed to be very destined. Yesterday at the Albuquerque airport, I bought something from a woman in cash register. I, I was paying attention to signs and various things on my trip. And we chatted a bit, exchanged whatever. And she said, you have a good time with your family. <laughs> and I heard that and I said, yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And even for those, you made it, but Saf uh, was telling me, I guess there was someone who was coming to this retreat all the way from the Netherlands and could not board the plane because he didn't have the proper, was the vaccination to get into the United States. He was very disappointed, but, but we're going to, Igor is filming it, and so to our dear friend, for all of us that made it or didn't make it, we're all going down this, this retreat together. We'll find out. He'll, he'll have to give us some feedback on how this topic <laughs> relates, relates to him. Yeah. Uh. Well, are there any requests for this, now that we know the, the theme, <laughs> any requests for, for anything for this uh, retreat? No more divorces. <laughs> <laughs> Union. Maybe, maybe the marriage part. Maybe. <laughs> Go maybe. deeper into the marriage part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. It is beautiful. I'm sure even in your, your marriage, which is quite new, that there's been some surprises and things that, that are showing themselves. Yeah. So it's, it's again that purpose, where if you, if you desire the purpose and the continuity, then it, it takes, takes over and uses the marriage for, for the higher, higher good of everyone. So that's a great topic. Yeah, that's a beautiful topic. Yes? It's a few classes a week that I share online. And I, it's helpful and I, so here's the telltale word, for the most part, I really enjoy it. Or I, I like it, I think I love it, but I'm not sure I enjoy it. 
And, and so, as simple as it is and how well it works, I'm feeling torn. Um, like here comes the divorce part. Like I'm sure within the next year, I will be completely done with it. And, and even though it's something I love. And, and I'll say, I'll ask Jesus for the guidance and it'll come in like just so clear. Um, it just feels good to be able to share this feeling and these thoughts in the presence of my family and with you, David, especially, and, and, um, and to just feel it bubble up and, and, and get it out and now. <laughs> What's next? That's what right. so, Thank you. <laughs> Beautiful. That's good. We're exploring the further reaches of, you know, it's, it's so interesting that of all the things that we've achieved and pursued and, and everything in this world, that, that this, we have like a state of mind goal. Like it's a state of mind goal. We're going for the highest state of mind possible. And to keep the context like, wow, that is so different than the form goals. The state of mind goal, you know, like to be happy. Mm -hmm. it's, imagine saying to your friends and relatives, instead of just, I love you, I happy you, I joy you. I peace you. I, I, I have no concern about, you know, what you do or don't do. I just wish you happiness. More than that, no, no, more than wish you happiness. I will you happy because God created us happy. Whoa, that just starts to transcend all of our concepts you know, really to, to will happiness. And Jesus is saying, He's saying, you are the light of the world and you bring the light with you to every circumstance and every situation you encounter. You are the love and you bring that love with you. You light the room up. You, you bring the joy, you bring the glee wherever you go. You're, who you are is is the purpose of everything. He then says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. The, the word within is actually unnecessary. The kingdom of heaven is you. Wow. So what a, what a state of mind to go for. And, and then we can start to realize, wow, if I really will love and will happiness and will joy, then, then I, I can't possibly hold on to expectations around my brothers and sisters. I can't be expecting them to act differently, or to talk differently, or to, to think differently. I, I want to will it. He says, will the Kingdom of Heaven. You can will it. And yeah, we were just talking about that before. What a, what a precious thing that we have to be able to use the power of our mind to will happiness to really will it, to choose it. And it's so different, it goes way outside the boxes, you know, <laughs> because we were kind of settling for compromise. We were set, settling for mediocre, you know. We were settling to, how's my life going, my relationship? Well, it's better than that one over there or over there. And Jesus is like, come on, get off of this. Yeah, and while it works really well, for a while, yeah. and then all of a sudden it's just, everything about it starts to plateau, and it's, everything yeah. you try, so it's just not going anywhere, right? What better sign do you need, right? And like yeah. for me, it's, it's, you gotta do less. Jeff, you just gotta keep doing less, which is just the <laughs> strangest thing. I know. Know. It is strange. <laughs> It is strange. We've become Just go have some fun, Jeff. I know. We've been so, become so accustomed to being the doer that what is I need do nothing. What? <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking? Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, you can really see where it, I, I like that workbook lesson, you know, where today I will judge nothing that occurs. Lord, let me not be your critic today and judge against you. 
Wow, you mean to tell me that if I just practice this lesson today, I will judge nothing occur. He's like teaching us. He says, you know the way the script is going today? It's just <laughs> divine. <laughs> and, and you just want to pick. <laughs> Oh, the toast is a little too brown there. <laughs> it's a little brown, a little too crunchy too, a little too hard. And then you go outside, now it's, we might see snow here for the first <laughs> 60 years, you know. You expect St. Augustine not to have snow. You come to a retreat, people say, you're going to St. Augustine, you're going to the beaches. Well, it's going to be 24 <laughs> degrees, <laughs> and we may have a winter wonderland. It may look more like Minnesota than say. But see, this is where Jesus, I think, is having some fun with us, where he's just saying, I just want you to go through a day and really enjoy everything. Enjoy when the dog barks. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy when the light turns green and the person in front of you doesn't, doesn't accelerate. Really enjoy it, like really go, oh you sweetie, you just stay in there at the green light, you know. He, he really wants you, he wants you to really like, to, to, to go through a whole day, just one day, without judging anything. Letting things, all things be exactly as they are. Wow, that's a high standard, but we're in for it. We're, we're the family of God. We've been called <laughs> to go for a state of mind. Wow. And, and what, it's new. I, I understand what you're saying because you're, we're so used to doing and achieving and organizing and you know, we've become masters at organizing. And then it's like he's taking it. <laughs> Here, give me that organizing skill. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, so it's truly an adventure. It's like a very intuitive adventure to be on. Yeah, and to, to be good. So I've been hearing the word in her mind, ascend. Yes, Jesus is even saying, don't, Jesus is saying, don't put me as above you or different from you. You know, I want you to merge, merge in the light now. Don't, don't even see me as, as different. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we are the same. Take my hand and walk with me to the light. Yeah. Yeah. That's precious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To really go for ascension, to yeah. go for the merge. That's very beautiful. Yes. One thing where I'm at in my life, and he, and he was saying this, like, and, and everybody has said it, like, what next? Like, what next? I mean, I'm 55 years old, I'm not getting any younger, been married, been divorced, live a simple life, what is it? Why am I here? What, what is my, I guess what I want to know is what is my calling? That's what I want. What is my calling? After all these years, what is my call? Following God, what is my calling? I still don't know. So, that's it. That's a good one, too, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I would keep seeing the letters five, five, or the numbers 555, five, five, just feeling like we're, we are on the cusp, just like we've been talking about, big Change. changes, big shifts. And it's funny that you say that, too, not to interrupt you, but I felt that. I was feeling that, too. I was feeling like this, this major shift. I even told my friend, I'm like, there's a major shift that's going to happen, and I think it's going to, something has to do with this retreat. I don't know what it is. And this morning when I got up, I was, um, I, I did on the, um, the uh, Course of Miracles website, we have a little eye that you can, you know, like an oracle, mm -hmm. and I pushed on that to see, and it was lesson 222. And when I was on my way here, and I'm looking at my destination arrival time, 222, I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was fun. The plot thickens. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We don't know what we're in for, but wow, I thank you for sharing that. Because that's, I think too, I think that's the way my, my life has gone, where I, I just tried to stay open and open, and many, many, many times where I was like, wow, didn't see that one coming, didn't see that one coming, gee, did not see that one coming, but, but it was all, it all worked out in the most wonderful, helpful ways, meeting people, you just, Never know. You, we just don't really know. We're not, we know we're not in charge. 
That's the best part, you know, we have believed that we were kind of partially or mostly in charge, <laughs> but now it's starting to become apparent that that we're not, we're not in charge. Not at all. Yeah. Yeah. Thank God for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you start to feel gratitude for that, like, mm -hmm. okay, what, what is it? Because at the beginning, when I first started just traveling and going, I just would have sometimes have thoughts like, what am I doing? Like this, is this my calling happening? And, and, and it really was wondrous and there were so many miracles and so many heart openings and mind openings that I was just so grateful for, but I, I could have never imagined it or predicted it in any way. So those are good topics. That sounds like that's why you're here. Mm -hmm. You're nothing short of your life's calling. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Well, I hope all of us can get some sleep tonight <laughs> after this. Yeah. And then tomorrow, around the same time, we come back for another um, session. And then, um, yeah, there's a movie that we've, uh, Jesus has given us. With great movie. A great movie, Queen Latifah is in it. And uh, it's a movie about just about this topic, about she's she's kind of got a pretty conservative life, and then things go wide open, and the miracles start to happen when she lets go into it. So that'll be a good movie, and then we'll have another session here, probably after we take a pause after the movie, and then we'll have it's a big dinner, a crisp. A Christmas Eve dinner <laughs> here, where we all get to have a family dinner, <laughs> family dinner here. So yeah, it's, it feels like it's going to be really wonderful. We'll just leave it in Jesus' hands and see what He shows us. Well, thank you. Thank you.